Good afternoon. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School. We want to welcome everybody to, I guess, this afternoon's forum here at the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum uh, to kick off the Black Policy Conference. I'm pleased to introduce one of the organizers of the conference, Gabrielle Wyatt. Gabrielle is a fellow at the Taubman Center for State and Local Government, is specializing uh, her studies in K-12 urban education reform. And she is, has, I hear the Kennedy School, she's coordinated the Public Policy Leadership Conference and is the co-chair of keynotes and fundraising for this particular conference. Gabrielle, please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Trey. And on behalf of the Black Policy Conference leadership team, welcome to the eighth annual Black Policy Conference at the Harvard Kennedy School. Today, we have the pleasure of being against the black job backdrop of the John F. Kennedy School Forum to celebrate heritage and horizons, seeking innovative solutions rooted in shared experiences. It is our hope that throughout this weekend, our conference participants generate innovative solutions to approach the world's most challenging problems. And without further ado, we'd like to begin that discussion here with our moderator, Farai Chidea. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here with you. I am one of the current fellows at the Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School of Government, and I'm having a fabulous time doing it. I want to introduce my panel, um, starting with the gentleman to my immediate left, Artur Davis. He's also a current resident fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics and a former four-term member of Congress, representing Alabama's 7th District from 2003 to 2007. And during this time, he was named by Esquire magazine as one of the 10 best congressmen in America. He graduated from Harvard University in 1990, which I also did, oddly enough, and Harvard Law School in 1993, which I did not. In 1992, he was named best oralist in the law school's Ames Moot Court competition. And then to our tour's left, we have April Ryan, the White House correspondent for American Urban Radio Networks and host of the White House Report, a daily feature broadcast nationwide. She's a member of the National Press Club and a 23-year journalism veteran. She began her career in Baltimore, Maryland, my hometown. You see there's all these weird connections. <laughs> at several radio stations and served as news director of WXYV-FM. She's a graduate of Morgan State University. And then to April's left, we have Ron Christie, who I do radio with. See, do you catch the theme here? It's a small colored world. <laughs> Ron, Ron Christie is the founder and president of Christie Strategies, an independent media and political consulting firm, and a veteran senior advisor for both the White House and Congress. He served as a resident fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics last term, and a visiting assistant professor at Haverford College, and adjunct professor at the George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Management. And then to Ron's left is Kelly Crossley, host and executive editor of The Kelly Crossley Show on WGBH Radio and a former resident fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics. Hmm. She was an Academy Award nominee and Emmy Award winner as a producer on the documentary series Eyes on the Prize. She'd been a producer on ABC News' 2020 and a panelist on WGBH's TV's Beat the Press. That is, Beat the Press. Um, she is a graduate of Wellesley College, so let's get a round of applause for this panel. So we could look at the interconnections between us as, oh, we just booked people who we knew. But really, it is kind of a small colored world when it comes to political journalism and political punditry um, when it comes to African Americans and a lot of people of color. To what extent is that an advantage or a disadvantage that you know so many of the players? I'm going to start with you, April, because you are dealing with the, the daily uh, issues of the presidential campaign? It's an advantage to a certain extent um, that you know the players. It's such, as you said, it's such a small number of us that are seen daily who have the ear of the president, who are called by name by the president. And because of that, when there are issues, particularly for the black community or for people of color, they make sure that they target you, they talk to you. For instance, uh, during the Bush years, Hurricane Katrina, I didn't even have to raise my hand. President Bush knew, okay, April, I know you have the next, the next question. 
And some issues during this presidency, President Barack Obama's presidency, particularly with the black farmers, he knew that I was one of the ones raising the issue. And because it's just so few of us, it, there is an advantage. But then at the same time, it's a disadvantage because mainstream media is always there. And they, particularly with this president, there's a universal approach, an everyone approach. But with that, they want to make sure that they touch black media. But it's, it's a fine line to walk for every president, not just this president. They don't want to be perceived as trying to pander to an audience. But at the same time, they want to make sure that audience hears their message and knows that they're reaching out. Ron, how do you, um, and you do TV, radio, you teach, uh, you run a strategy company, you wear many hats. Uh, there have been many times that many African Americans and other people of color have said to me, just be careful, don't get put in the black box, meaning mm -hmm. where you're only called upon to talk about race. You obviously have had a career, particularly in Republican uh, administrations, where you, you, I'm sure, transcended the black box in many ways. But how do you uh, both act responsive to mm -hmm. the inevitable questions of race in America, but also make sure that you're heard on, on other specialties of yours? You know, it's, it's interesting that you say that, Farai, because when I joined the Bush administration, I was initially the vice president's uh, deputy domestic policy advisor, and then I switched over to be a domestic policy advisor for the president. And you go there and you think, I am going to be the best darn policy advisor that there is because I'm smart, I'm a lawyer, I'm this. And then you look around and you recognize that there are not as many folks that look like you. And then you feel an obligation, particularly in working in the Bush White House, where sometimes I felt that there were certain areas that they could have been more sensitive on issues of race. And if you don't speak up and if you don't offer your voice, it's an opportunity missed. And for me, uh, I went to our chief of staff. This was right after uh, Trent Lott made his infamous comments about uh, the former Senator uh, Strom Thurmond. Uh, and the insinuation, of course, was that uh, if, if uh, Strom Thurmond had been elected president, well, as the Dixiecrat candidate, that, you know, perhaps a lot of us in this room uh, who look like those of us on the stage would be in a different place. And I was so angry when that happened, and I thought, you know, special assistants to the president don't march over to the chief of staff, to the president of the United States, and say, we're blowing it, and we're missing an opportunity. And I wrote him a four-page letter, and I started off by saying, Dear Secretary Card, and I went through and said, I can't rationalize it to myself, can't rationalize it to my family, I certainly can't rationalize it to anyone outside of these gates if we remain silent and if we don't address an issue of racial insensitivity. And uh, when he called me the next morning, I thought I was going to get fired. But instead, it opened a dialogue. And so I found that, as, as April pointed out, it's a double-edged sword. It's a good in many respects because people are looking to you. And, and it's also a bad thing because people are also looking to you. And Artur, um, as a congressman serving in Alabama and as a candidate for governor of the state, you have been able to see many of the, the, the commonalities and the divisions that typify American politics. And in fact, your work here at the IOP, this term is sort of a, a blow by blow of what it takes to run for president. Um, how do you see, uh, what, what did you learn from your terms in Congress about the issues of race and how they play into politics, and then how does that apply? Do any of those lessons apply to the current presidential race? Well, let me put it in the context of actually the, the conversation the first three panelists have talked about, uh, the getting put in the box syndrome. I was in Congress for eight years, and it was a, was a pretty good eight years for African American members of Congress. Uh, at one point when Democrats said the majority, I think there were seven African-American members who were chairmen of committees, uh, another seven who were chairmen of subcommittees. About 15 or 16 uh, walked around being Mr. Chairman, and you kind of want to be Mr. Chairman if you're on the Hill. It's a good thing. What was always interesting, though, whenever there are subjects of jurisdiction or a topic of controversy, it was amazing that the mainstream press never seemed to call on them. And in a previous lifetime, I used to watch a lot of the shows on Sunday morning. I, I don't do that stuff now. If I watch The Voice and things like that, 
Um, but in a previous lifetime, I used to watch the Sunday morning stuff, and I would always be struck. They would often talk about tax policy. And weirdly, there was this guy, I think, think you've heard him, I think his name is Wrangle, <laughs> who kind of knew a lot about that and became the chair of the committee and was the ranking member before that. And I would never, even before his ethics stuff started, even before that, I would never see Charlie Rangel talking about tax policy. You know, Benny Thompson and I didn't see eye to eye on a whole lot of stuff, frankly. But Benny was the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. Homeland Security is a kind of big, broad topic. We tend to talk about it every 9-11. We talk about it. Ron, you know, when you, know, you guys had the White House and did the terror alerts every few months, you know, uh, uh, we would talk about it a lot. And I would never see Benny Thompson, the ranking member of the committee, eventually the chairman of the committee, ever talking about homeland security. And I could keep on going if we had enough time for me to keep on going. You kind of get my drift. So I don't want anybody to think that it's just pundits or talking heads or those of us, you know, who write blogs and that kind of thing. Mine is official, ArturDavis.com. Okay, I got that in. Um, well done. Thank you. It's not just those of us who are talking heads. It's kind of elected people, and it's people who have proved their spurs by becoming committee chairmanships. You know, so we're you know, obviously going to talk a lot today about all these cosmic things around race and politics and probably something that happened in Florida, I think, a week ago that maybe you've heard something about. Um, and we should talk about that, because it's always very important. But my little two cents worth is we have started on exactly the right note. We've started on exactly the right note by asking the question, why are voices of color often put in a particular limited context? And I'll make this my final point, because I don't want to leave good old Harvard out of the conversation. Um, I went here as an undergrad and as a law student. And you know, by and large, I liked it. You know, and it still looks good on a resume for all the folks who are here. Um, and I remember being in a class that I enjoyed very much talking about, uh, it was a course about politics. And the guy who ran the section was a good guy, and uh, was a very good section leader, and he would start every week by doing a week in review of what had happened in politics. And... Uh, I happened to be here when Jesse was deciding, am I going to run for president <clears throat> a third time? And Jesse was the front runner in the polls. Mary and Barry kind of got in some stuff in DC. And I remember a couple of times he would call on me and then he would say, Artur, um, what do black people think about Mary and Barry's situation? <laughs> what do black people think about Jesse running a third time? And the first couple of times, you know, the first time it kind of hurt my feelings because I thought I knew more than that. The second time, <clears throat> you know, you go from hurt feelings to being offended. The third time I figured, hell, it's a chance to say what Artur Davis thinks. <laughs> um, the point is this doesn't go away. I think it's an incredible challenge that everybody who's black or brown or yellow or Hispanic or black or Indian or Pacific in this room has got to appreciate. There are a lot of people who are going to look at you and decide, yeah, maybe you're smart, maybe you went to Harvard, but I'll bet you really kind of your specialty is this. I think it's an enormous problem. I think it limits us in all kinds of ways. So, Callie, what about the, let me dig into media a little bit. You and I are both, uh, you know, people who continue to persevere in what some people think of as a dying industry. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, the, the level of competition, the mergers, the shrinkage. I mean, my first job was at Newsweek, which is now run by the Daily Beast. Yeah. I don't get it, but, you know, um, how does that affect the ability to really have good, strong coverage during a political year and other years, um, which includes important racial topics and is not limited to those. It just means that stuff gets overlooked. Um, I say all the time, there's one truth but many perspectives. And what happens when you don't have the voices in the room, many voices in the room, to talk about whatever is the central issue of the day is that you've lost something in terms of understanding in a holistic way what the issues really are and how they impact all of us here in a community. 
uh, and I see it over and over again. And for those who always say, well, you know, there's only one way to look at it, uh, you know, I've been in so many discussions when I raise my voice and say, but what about, now? oh, oh yeah, I guess so. There's a way of thinking about that. <laughs> so it's a huge loss. Um, and you know, back to that double-edged sword thing, sometimes you're in the uncomfortable position of being the only voice to raise it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be <laughs> just about race, but about a different way of looking at something that may be informed by the fact that I am a person of color. So I come to the table looking at things a little bit more broadly just because of the nature of my experience, uh, both as a human being and as a journalist uh, working in this business. Uh, and I can't say how valuable it is to have those other voices in the room at all times. And even those of us on this, or at this panel, uh, I know, are weary sometimes. Do I have to say it one more time? But, <laughs> you know, you just have to, because there's always somebody new in the room that just didn't get it the first go around. Well, speaking of uh, an issue with one truth but many perspectives, I am going to go to that case in Florida, uh, Trayvon Martin's death which has become a real media firestorm. Uh, and, you know, I've done some radio and TV around it, but I think we're reaching a point where there's more heat than light. Um, and I think we need to really focus in on what some of the central issues are. And to me, it's that, uh, you know, and this is my personal opinion, but that we have a very bad law that is influenced by lobbying patterns in America and is replicated across 20 U.S. states and that it's not just an issue of justice for one young man, it's an issue of many unarmed people who've been killed as a result of a, a pattern of laws that, that were pushed. Um, but I just want to take this into the presidential arena because we are supposed to talk about the presidency. And so President Obama said, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon after many days of saying nothing. Uh, just recently, Robert Zimmerman, the father of George Zimmerman, said, I never foresaw so much hate coming from the president, the Congressional Black Caucus, and the NAACP. Mitt Romney said, what happened to Trayvon Martin is a tragedy. There needs to be a thorough investigation. Uh, Rick Santorum said, stand your ground is not doing what this man did. There's a difference between stand your ground and doing what he did. Newt Gingrich said uh, the district attorney had done the right thing in impaneling a grand jury. And of Zimmerman, he said it was pretty clear that this is a guy who found a hobby that's very dangerous, uh, meaning neighborhood, armed neighborhood watch. So you would, aside from George Zimmerman's father, you would see some you know, apparent unanimity of critique of what's gone on. What, what impact, if any, do these, not, uh, does the Trayvon Martin case in particular, and do these sort of aha racial moments in general have on political races? Ron, uh, well, April, go ahead. It looks like you want to, and then I'll go to you, Ron. It has a lot to do with the presidential campaign. If you're president, you're president of all America, no matter who you are, what party, what have you. Everything comes to the White House, from war to peace, to everything in between. And yes, Trayvon Martin in the White House's lap. And yes, you said the president came out talking about it um, just recently after days. Literally, the White House had been working on crafting some kind of response. The Justice Department was working on crafting some type of response. Early in that week, they were polling reporters. I got a call. What do you think about the Trayvon Martin issue? And one thing I said, I said, I know you don't want this in your lap. And the reason why, and seriously, because the reason why I said that, because there was a big mistake made with this president with the Henry Louis Gates situation at a press conference. Then you had also the Shirley Sherrod issue. They had to craft a statement that was general enough, but where he took ownership as well of it that the Justice Department was reviewing it. But now, at the same time, the Republican candidates for president, and I'm just going to be blunt about this, uh, the black agenda is not on the radar at all, and we've seen it. Um, they, I mean, numbers of black Americans going to the polls during these primaries are not even measurable. But all of the Republican candidates did at least they make a did statement. They did because they had to, because Barack Obama, Barack Obama, the president of this country, the leader of the free world, spoke. Mm 
And that forced them to say something about it, particularly in light of gun laws, gun issues. They are strong proponents of the NRA. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff rallying around it. But, and also, they're more so courting the Hispanic vote, not necessarily the black vote. So they had to prepare something that would not push them out of the way, make, make the Tea Party dislike them and the NRA dislike them, but something that was broad enough where whatever happened, they would be okay. So I, when it's something of this level and this magnitude that could really be another Rodney King powder cake kind of issue, depending on what happens at the end, they had to come in and step in because they are literally the moral leader of this country, the leader of this country. They set the tone in so many respects. Oh, go ahead, Ron. Sorry. Well, I, and I, I'll, I'll take the Nothing. last uh, three words that, uh, that April said, you know, setting the tone. And I think the president did not set the right tone with what he said with Trayvon. I think he should have gone much further. The thing that I took exception with what he said, and you know, it's time to stir it up. This is the JFK Jr. forum, so wait for it. <laughs> yeah. Is that he said, if I had a son, he would look like Trayvon. And I was stunned when I heard that. And I thought, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? What does it mean that if you had a son, he would look like Trayvon? You could say, I'm a father. I'm a parent. He did say he was a father. But I thought he was injecting himself into an issue in a way that was not productive. And I was upset that the president didn't say, people need to chill out. This is a very sensitive issue. We need to learn what all the facts are. But by him saying, oh, we need to have a soul-searching moment, I, again, we don't know what all the facts are. What are we soul searching on, Mr. President? The, the only thing that we know is that a 17-year-old boy was shot dead. And he was shot dead by a neighborhood watchman who was armed, who in my view shouldn't have been armed and who should have been arrested. That's all we know. And was told to stand down. And the fact that our president said that if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon, I think in many respects only added a little bit more kerosene to say, see, now President Obama jumped in this, and it is a racial issue. So now that it's a racial issue, now folks need to get riled up on issues of race as opposed to being more dispassionate and being looking at this on a matter of facts. Arthur. You know, <clears throat> there are about a 1,000 things to be said about this. Let me just try to pull out three of them. Um, this is one of the big concerns I have about the Trayvon Martin controversy. And let, let's, let's stipulate the obvious. You know, unless somebody in here is one of the two eyewitnesses, and that probably is not the case, not one of us knows what happened, so let's stipulate that and get that hedge out of the way one time. Now, having said that, if it turns out that George Zimmerman is telling the 100% gospel truth, if it turns out that Trayvon Martin actually did slam his head to the ground and actually did try to take the gun, if Zimmerman's version is vindicated, that still does not excuse the fact that all kinds of people who look out of place because of the hue of their skin, if they're not getting shot, they're getting detained, they're getting questioned, they're getting analyzed, and they're getting profiled, and eventually if enough of that goes on, somebody does get hurt. On the flip side of it, if it turns out that somebody comes forward tomorrow and says that I saw this thing and what Zimmerman says is 100% false, if it turns out that Zimmerman is convicted and black folks are jumping up and down the streets about it, that is not going to solve the fact that the very hour after that, some other black kid's going to wander into the same kind of situation. There's not going to be a national day off. So every time... I hear us obsessing about one controversy. I don't care if it's this. I don't care if it was Sherrard. I don't care if it was Rodney King back in the day when I was here. I was a student here when that happened. We get so worked up over one person, and of course we ought to care about the tragedy that happened here. But we forget the fact that the resolution of that one person saga still leaves us with the same set of problems. Electing a black president didn't lift race off the backs of the American people and off the backs of many of us sitting in this room. That's a reality. My final point, I'll follow Ron's instinct. You know, we're here at Harvard, so you guys say something controversial. <laughs> this does remind me of one other thing. 
may I use the we for a moment in a literal sense, the we meaning folks of color in the room. We have to be very careful about over-invoking racism and race and racial injustice. And I'll be very candid with you. We love to do it. African-American politicians under investigation for something. We love to talk about the number of African-American politicians under investigations if there are no white ones under investigation. We love to talk about patterns. We love to invoke the specter of racial injustice. We love to say that every time a new measure is passed that says you got to do one extra thing to vote, oh, that's the ugly hand of Jim Crow. We like to say that, and it sounds good. It gets you a nice amen in the church. It makes you feel kind of nice and warm. The only problem is, as good as it sounds, eventually the real wolf does come knocking at the door. And when the real wolf shows up at the door, and if it turns out that Zimmerman's lying, that is what happened that night, then it sounds like what we're saying and the outrage we're evoking, it sounds like it's what we've said and the way we've said it and how we've said it before, and it doesn't resonate, frankly, the way that it should. So I would just make those two cautionary points. However this plays out, don't think it's going to solve anything or end anything, and be careful about how we talk about wolves being at the door because there are some real ones and they'll show up, and we better know how to talk about those when they do show up. Well, Kelly, one of the things that recently I participated in a forum at the Schomburg in New York, the African American Studies Library in New York, uh, and on the panel was Randall Kennedy, uh, professor of law here at Harvard. And in the process of conversation, one of the things that came out was that although we have this black president, President Obama, in some ways, perhaps he is the least equipped to deal with structural racial injustice in the criminal justice system because it's a third rail for black politicians. So do you think, you know, inject whatever else you feel along the lines of the Trayvon case, but do you think that in some ways the, there is a, a stricture against black politicians? I mean, the wolf could be at your door 10 times in one night, you know? I mean, it, the, the wolf could be at your door one time, but it could also be 10 times. Maybe one time it's the cat, but it could be, <laughs> could be the wolf, you know? And, and so in what, under what circumstances can you really challenge particularly structural injustice, not just uh, sporadic injustice? I, I think as a black politician, uh, uh, not very much. But as the leader of the free world, mm -hmm. he has a Justice Department. So it was, it's, it's under his power to say to the Justice Department, let's go see what's going on in Florida. So that's what he can do in that. But absolutely, it flies back in his face because people are going to say, and this very polarized kind of, I can't even call it a dialogue, I don't know what it is, discussion, ranting that's going on in this country right now, that whomever you are speaking, and particularly if you bring to the table that you are black and are speaking about race, it somehow gets trans, uh, translated into racism. So let me pick up something that our tour said. You know, I tell people this all the time. The last person in the room that wants to call it racism I'm talking about thoughtful people, is the black person. I don't want to be the one to say, did she not wait on me first? I don't want to be the one to say, they're looking for my son or my nephew to shoot down. I want to think it's anything else but that. So what happens in the way that this conversation gets translated is that people, I think, impose on persons of color a lot, saying we scream racism all the time. When we're the last people that want to call it out, we really are. We don't want it to be there. We want it to be anything else but that. You know? But when it's there, let's everybody face up to it. And I think that's the frustrating thing around the, the Trayvon Martin case, or for that matter, some of the kind of negativity that we've seen that's uh, racially uh, based, directed at Michelle Obama and President Obama, and I hear no other voices except black folks say, come on, y'all, recognize this, speak up, say, that's not right. This is what it is. 
And mm -hmm. so to the extent that we are still operating in a context, and I take your point, uh, Tor, we are operating in a context of this is going to go on not just today but tomorrow and the next day, and we have to recognize that and figure out how we're going to go forward. But to your point, uh, Ron, I would say that's why then President Obama said this that Trayvon could be my son. He recognized the undertone of that is about the ongoing racial context. So to not say anything about that in the slightest, most carefully crafted way that he could is just disingenuous. It, I mean, I, I just think it was disingenuous. I really do think so. Yeah. You know. you know, let me you know say something responding you know to what Callie said, and maybe going a little bit of a different direction with it. We have a fairly short attention span as an American community. We kind of remember what happened this morning and yesterday is a stretch and last week is forever. Um, I remember an episode about six months ago and I won't pick on the gentleman by calling his name but he's a prominent figure in the civil rights community and someone who's a smart guy. Um, and he was talking about the phenomenon of quote unquote racism and the response to Barack Obama. And I think he made some points that were very good. But then he took it a point too far, and it's instructive where he went too far. He said two years ago, and I'm quoting him, when the Tea Party folks were out there and they were holding up these signs showing Obama with the Hitler mustache, can you imagine a Caucasian president being treated in that disrespectful way. We've never seen anything like this. The host of the show paused for a moment and said, I want to show you something. And of course, he puts up a clip of George Bush with a Hitler mustache and Dick Cheney with a Hitler mustache and a protest in Washington, D.C. And if that night was the first time you saw that, you missed a lot of the coverage back in 03 and 04. A lot of ugly things have been said about Barack Obama that are disrespectful, that are dumb, that have no basis. Newsflash. Being president of the United States apparently entitles a lot of people to feel they can say dumb and disrespectful and dumb things about you. I have this memory of another guy, I don't think we forget him, he was once called the first black president until we got the first black president. Uh, his name is William Jefferson Clinton. And I have great admiration for him, and I mean that in all seriousness. Um, at one point, you know, yeah, people say this crazy thing that Obama was a Muslim. You know, I, you know, Pastor, what was, what was his name, Wright? Mm -hmm. Pastor Wright looks like anything but a Muslim to me, so I kind of put that aside, and then I saw it right. But th that thing continues to float around, and it's stupid, and it's dumb. You know what said about Bill Clinton? That he used to be the biggest drug dealer in Arkansas and used to run drugs out of a private airport in the mountains in the Ozarks, that when his White House counsel committed suicide, that Clinton had him killed because he was going to spill the beans on Whitewater. It was alleged that he had raped a woman, in fact two, I believe, and I won't even repeat some other things that probably never made it into broad circulation but were commonly said. And I could kind of go back through the charts. Um, None of that said to say that there aren't some people who dislike Barack Obama who don't have race at the core of their hearts. In my experience, so many people in this world walk around with race at the core of their hearts. There's no reason to think that they stop when they talk about Obama. They bring in so many other things. But I think we have to be, as the last time I said, I want to be mindful of this. We live in a time where contempt toward people we disagree with is a common political play and it's awful. This notion that if we don't agree with somebody's politics that we ought to tear them down. This notion that if somebody doesn't think like us that there's something wrong with them. The left has a tendency of thinking if you don't agree with me then there's something wrong with your brain. The right has a tendency of saying, if you don't agree with me, there's something wrong with your soul. If we can get past the politics of labeling people brainless and soulless, I think we'll be a lot better off and we'll have, have a better conversation. I have, I have to jump in here because we actually are now in Q&A time and we didn't even get to a couple of the big issues that I'm hoping 
some people will raise, like uh, before, before, we, before we wrap up, we will go through a speed round and see what you think the president's chances of re-election are. Um, I'll just point out that there was a CNN poll this week that said that his approval ratings had inched over the 50% mark for the first time since last May. And then there were, there were other approval ratings that were lower because polls are polls. Um, also that the same poll said that uh, if the general election were held today that President Obama would win handily over Mitt Romney or any other Republican opponent. And then there's the issue, uh, another issue that I find you know, very persistently troubling, which is the black unemployment rate being you know, uh, double that. Uh, it actually rose. The, the overall unemployment rate stayed stable for the past couple months at 8.3%. The black unemployment rate actually rose, and it's at 14.1%. So I'm hoping that some of you wise people in the audience will be able to craft questions. We have microphones here, um, and folks can line up, and I will give you the, uh, the drill. The drill. All questioners must identify themselves. One brief question per person, no speeches. Questions end with a question mark. <laughs> All right? Please. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Wilson. I'm from the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, D.C. Thank you, everyone. My question has to do with voter suppression and what you all uh, believe is the effect or will be the effect on the election of these ID uh, laws and how we should, um, as a group of people of color, not limited to the color box, but what should be our strategies to, um, to deal with these ID laws and their, their obviously um, um, uh, you know, intention of reducing the number of people of color, poor people, students, et cetera, at the polls? Thank you. April? Congressman James Clyburn, um, the assistant minority head, the assistant, uh, what? Uh, yeah. But. Of, uh, on the Hill, he said, and he's also the head of the uh, anti-voter suppression effort at the DCCC, and he said, look, it's going to happen. Bottom line, it's going to happen, the fact that you're going to have to have your ID card when you go to the polls. He said, everyone needs to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, that you get some kind of state uh, ID, <clears throat> excuse me, state-issued ID so that you can go to the polls. But you, you don't just have that. You have the issue of the fact that this is not going to be, for many African Americans, the big one again. You'll never have that big moment, that first moment. And there's an issue right now that intensity. So you, have, you don't just have the voter suppression issue, you have intensity issues, okay? You had 90% plus go to the polls for Barack Obama. Now, the, the, the Obama campaign is extremely concerned about intensity and factoring in the unemployment numbers, factoring in the fact that black people, and I think some of this Trayvon Martin issue is a culmination of so much. There are so many African Americans that are just disenchanted about so many things, and they're scared to speak out because of fear that it could hurt the president. And I think this is a lot of that this, is, this Trayvon Martin issue has evolved into a lot of things for black so America. So di displaced anxiety. Displaced anxiety, perfect term. And that's why we're seeing that. But when you go to the polls, it's not just the voter suppression. It's about what you're feeling internally as well. So there are several factors, I think, that black America really needs to face in the mirror and look, in, look at themselves in the mirror to see, you know, why am I going to the polls? You know, the big moment is gone. And I think this is what black America has to, has to really deal with when they go to the polls eight months from now. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you know, let me, you know, shock you by saying something about voter ID. Um, voter ID, voter photo ID, frankly, doesn't bother me. And I know that that opinion may separate me from some of you in this room. But let me try to quickly say why. Um, whenever I hear somebody say that an ID requirement is oppressive, I have to step back from that and ask the question, how many times are we asked to present ID in the course of our citizenship? 
the Department of Justice is in court right now challenging three voter ID laws. It's violative of the Voting Rights Act. You can't get in the Department of Justice without a photo ID. It so happens that you can't get in a lot of private buildings in Washington and New York without an ID. It so happens that if you show up and try to get on a plane without an ID, they got to make a whole bunch of phone calls. And if you happen to be an Arab person and show up without an ID, I haven't seen any of those factors evoke a great deal of outrage in our society. Now, whenever I say that, people come back and say, well, Mr. Davis, the difference is that we have a right to vote. We don't have a right to get on a plane. We don't have a right to enter a building. The first thing I say is, when somebody tells you not to enter a building or get on a plane, tell me how you feel. But putting that aside, and all of a sudden you may discover you think you do have some rights. So putting that aside, there's this interesting notion that if you have a right in this country that nobody can attach a burden to it. Because that's really at the heart of what people say when they're attacking voter ID. They're saying, because I have a right, you can't put a burden on this. You can't make me have to do something extra. And I feel you on that. But here's the problem. When you turn 18 in this country, you don't become auto-enrolled to vote. And by the way, I don't see anybody in the political spectrum saying you ought to be auto-enrolled to vote when you turn 18. We have something called registration. Registration don't happen, if I can be colloquial, by snapping your fingers and saying I'm registered. You have to fill a form out. If you choose to vote absentee, you often have to stand in line. You have to get somebody to notarize your form. Do you have a right to vote absentee? You bet you do in every state. But right. you have to jump through some hoops to do it. So my only point is, if you're concerned that, a, if, if you're a political person in this room, if you register people to vote and you're active politically and you're worried about voter ID, as this young lady seems to be, that, that's okay. Here's how you handle that worry. Get out and make sure the folks you want to vote have an ID. The right. same way if you worry about there. people registering to vote, you get out and register them to vote. All right. I have a feeling other folks want to follow up on this. I'm going to go to the next question. We can circle back to this if, if we'd like. Uh, hello. My name is Flash Wiley. I'm a, an alumni uh, uh, in the public policy program in 74. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting that, uh, that black people talk so much about having our points of view aired and heard and discussed and everything. And, and what we don't do, um, and I'd like the panel to start on this, is to uh, make our thoughts heard effectively, which is we do a lot of talking, but when it comes to voting day, we're supposed to show up, and whether it's rain, snow, sleet, or hail, we are there registering our opinions uh, as we were given the right to do, and our forefathers, uh, many of them bled for that to happen. Um, we're not there. So what is it about us that keeps us uh, talking and, and raising the good fight uh, philosophically, but we don't take care of business when it comes time to take care of business? Kelly? Well, what I would say is that, you know, people have to feel that that vote is connected to their lives. Um, and, you know, when they do, they get out and vote. As you said, when, that, when that, that turnout happened last time for Barack Obama, uh, for that election, because people felt that that was somehow connected to their lives. I am fond of saying that Pookie got off the couch that time and voted. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know who Pookie is. I, I, met, I, I met Pookie <laughs> at the inauguration. He was at the inauguration. <laughs> yeah. And Pookie never gets up to do nothing. Because, <laughs> but, that, but, but Pookie felt connected in that moment. Now, to your point about the unemployment, Farai, I don't know that Pookie feels connected this year. You know, so, that for, so for Pookie and for some, many other people like him, the question is, uh, will it make a difference if I get up? I don't see that it makes a difference. Because Pookie is not those of us who are able to go to the federal building and get on the plane and do whatever. He's part of the 25% of African Americans without any government issued ID. That's versus white people without the same lack of documentation. 70% of the electoral votes 
right now are held in states with photo ID laws. Now, however you look at that, that's a political situation. That's a let's get busy and tell people why they need to get an ID. Whatever it is, that's the reality at this moment. And some laws are still yet to be enacted. Um, and this is against a context, I have to just answer this about this photo ID thing, mm -hmm. when there has not been demonstrated fraud. I'm okay with it if you can demonstrate to me there's some fraud, that everybody who shows up or every third person or every second person who shows up is fraudulent. All right, let's, let's make sure, you know, take them through all the hoops, but that is not the case. So something else is going on here. Somehow that story that seems up here has to be connected with the folk who are not voting to make them understand that you know, there, are, there is a lot at stake uh, in this election and in every election, actually. And you know what? In more elections than most, this one coming up, if we presume the nominee, is going to provide for Americans an extremely stark contrast, this is a policy conference, about policy mm -hmm. and about how, how policy should be directed. And people need to be paying attention to that. We have two questioners uh, up here. I'm going to start on the right. Hi, my name is Luciana Milano. I'm a sophomore at the college and kind of as a follow-up, um, but I want to preface it by saying I think that race plays a, diff um, a different role in the Democratic and um, the Republican parties, and maybe you guys can address that in your question. You may or may not dis may disagree with me. Um, but I wanted to, and this might be slightly controversial, but I wanted to ask to what extent do you believe that race is often used as an instrument in politics? Well, that's, that's the, <laughs> no, I, that's gonna go to. I, I actually think, you know, when we talk about the voter ID uh, and the, the voter suppression uh, comment, that I think that it's being used as a wedge issue against Republicans, that somehow Republicans want to suppress the votes of, of people of color, and that Republicans, you know, are putting together this new Jim Crow era poll tax. And I think it's absolute nonsense. I think that, as, as we've heard, you can't exist in the 21st century in America without an ID. You can't go in many. Oh, you you can. Oh, I'm I'm a field I'm a field reporter who goes out to those towns <laughs> where there is nothing but the corner store at the but intersection I, of Tree and Rock. I I <laughs> and, and I, I, I agree. <laughs> and you and I, and, I, and I, I, yeah. I agree with that, but, but I'm only looking at my own example. I'm looking at my relatives who are from rural Valdosta, Georgia, which is an extraordinarily out-of-the-way spot. Miraculously, my 98-year-old grandmother has a voter ID. And this notion, and I think it's absolute nonsense, that Republicans are seeking to divide the country on race and seeking to suppress minority votes to win an election is nonsense. Going to your point, Callie, of, oh, there's no demonstrable proof or this is some sort of Republican... Um, which hunt? Uh, no, no, no. no uh, uh, fraud. That's, uh, what uh, that's what I'm going to. Yeah, yeah. You look at the election in Minnesota. The, the Congressman Norm Coleman, who had that seat, it is proven that there are more folks who were illegally registered to vote, who voted and cast a vote in that election, who cost him his Senate seat to Al Franken. So I need to go no further. And in Minnesota, let me, let me say, is not exactly a place where you're saying you're trying to suppress the minority vote. So there's one instance where I think that it's demonstrably false that to say that it never happens in an instance where I think that uh, the Democratic Party is trying to stir up uh, energy in the base to get folks to vote and to say Republicans are racist. Can I quickly okay. jump in? Well, let me, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Kelly had happened. her hand up and this, then I'll Let me be clear. I didn't say it never happened. I said in order for us to be making this kind, it seems to me, this kind of intense move, there ought to be one out of every two people are fraudulent voters. That is, there's no so, but evidence the Kelly, of that. Well, you know, we'll there isn't. And, that, and the other thing okay. that I, I, I need to say about that, it's when yeah, everybody it's leading the voter ID, you know, campaign is Republican, well, people look at the Republican and say, well, what you doing? And why? The only state where I know that there were black people as a part of the discussion, you know, really, you know, a lot of black folk was Rhode Island. Rhode Island has a voter ID law, and there were black lawmakers who feel extremely strongly about it. So that's the only state I know about, but the rest, and by the way, those are Democrats. That's the reason I raised it, too. Those are black Democrats involved in uh, supporting the voter ID law that is now in place in Rhode Island. But every place else, I don't, I don't know any place well, else. So you've got to draw some second. conclusion. Let me jump in for one second. Uh, Fifteen seconds on this point. The guy who served in Congress before I did, 
in Lowndes County, Alabama in the Democratic primary in 1992, he got 130 votes. In the runoff, he got 13,000 votes. You do the math. Let me speak to this young lady's question up here. Your question was about race and how it plays out in both parties. I won't do a song and dance in this, but I'll give you one example. In a governor's race in Louisiana in 2003, there was a minority running. He was not a black person, but he was an Indian brother. And he looked like an Indian guy. About five days before the election, his opponent circulated a flyer that showed him with long hair. They darkened the photo to make a dark man look even darker. And the only place they decided that they want to hand out that photo happened to be in the George Wallace territories in Louisiana. And you could do it like clockwork. Every county George Wallace carried when he ran for president in the state of Louisiana is where they handed out these flyers. The Indian guy was named Bobby Jindal, and he lost the election, came back and won a second time, which often happens in politics, but he lost that time. He had a five-point lead with a week ago until they frankly went heavy race on him. For those who want the rest of the facts filled in, the they was the Louisiana Democratic Party. And Jindal is a Republican. So all I would say to you is, I'm not going to sit here and, and say anything to you other than this. There are folks in both political parties who use race when they feel like it as a political instrument. There are Democrats who are as happy to use it as Republicans. And yes, there are some Republicans who have a sad history of doing it too. There was a man named Jesse Helms. Yeah. All but right. let's well, not I, think I it's to... just a partisan thing. <laughs> okay. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Jacob Merlo. I'm a freshman here at the college, and I'd like to ask this question on behalf of the JFK um, Forum Committee here at the IOP. Um, so I'm aiming this question at Mr. Christie specifically. Um, I know that you addressed this in your recent book, um, Black in the White House, but could you describe um, what role race, your race played in, during your time in the White House? Do you feel that you were treated differently, either positively or negative, um, as a result? Thank you. Well, Jacob, it's great to see you again. Uh, Jacob was a, a, a often and frequent participant in my study group, and it's, it's nice to see friendly faces for me to come back here. So thank you uh, for your question. Um, yes. They're I, all friendly to you today, Ron. Oh, <laughs> I, we're not done yet, Arthur. Uh, I, I think that uh, I'll tell you a story, and it, it's, it's in the book, and it, and it upset me um, as it related to some of the, the ways I think that we could have been a lot more sensitive on issues of race in the Bush White House. I was ecstatic to be in the East Room of the White House when uh, Coretta Scott King presented President Bush with a portrait of her husband. And he was pretty fired up about it, and he said, I can hardly wait to hang it. And I thought, that's great. And I, I waited a couple of weeks, and there was no portrait anywhere. And so I thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting. So I went through the East Room, I went through the West Wing, I went everywhere, and I couldn't find it. And I went to the Chief of Staff, and I said, hey, Chief, what happened to that portrait that Coretta Scott King gave to uh, the president. He said, I don't know, I'll look into it. Well, someone had carted it up and put it in a box and shipped it off in a federal facility. So the portrait came back. The chief of staff said, I want it back. And he said, Ron, what do you think we should hang it? And I said, chief, we should hang this portrait in the East Room where all the visitors who are coming in the White House tour will get a chance to see it. Perfect. Hung up on the wall. There it was. Awesome. A few weeks later, gone. And it disappeared, and again, it was gone. And I said to myself, how in the heck is it that we have a White House staff when we've been given a portrait of Dr. Martin Luther King by his wife that someone continues to take this thing and put it somewhere, you know, that scene at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yep. Is that where this portrait's going? It's a curated off to get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, mm. So, so the whole point of the matter is, and it goes back to my, my earlier uh, commentary, is that I felt that if I didn't speak up, that no one else seemed to care that this portrait wasn't there. And if we can't even hang a picture of Dr. Martin Luther King in the White House, what else are we doing wrong? And that started, Jacob, my uh, really crusade in the White House to speak out and to sort of be a vocal figure of saying, if we can't get a portrait right, what else are we doing wrong here? Dr. King's bust is still in the White House, though. It is. It's still there. Okay. There is a bust of Dr. King in the White House in the library, so he's been there since Clinton years, and he's now in the Oval Office. Good spot to be. Yeah. He's, on, he's on the move. He's on he's the on move. move. <laughs>
please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sita Gofard. I'm a freshman at Harvard College. Um, and my question is, well, we've talked a lot about the, the problems surrounding politics and the uh, enduring issue of race. Um, but what can actually be done on Capitol Hill and also on a personal level uh, in our individual lives to try to rectify those problems as much as we can? And are you optimistic that change will come uh, soon? Can April? I, can I, um, I've been Thank at the you. White House for 15 years. From Bill Clinton, the last term of Bill Clinton, to the whole eight years of George W. Bush to this president. And what I've found in my reporting daily is that the squeaky wheel gets the oil. I don't care what your agenda item is or what the issue is. Um, one of the presidents told A. Philip Randolph, you know, your idea is great. Can fine. you explain who A. Philip Randolph yeah, is? Because really one of the things I've learned is not to assume. Not to assume, OK? Pullman Porter, OK? Trains back in the day. Now, the eye that he you wanted to. You might need that explained. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, no, okay. Powerful, yeah. powerful yeah. black yeah. union yeah. civil rights organizer. I'm trying to give a synopsis of a synopsis for the sake of time. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, here's, okay. <laughs> but here's what I'm going to tell you. He was told, hey, you know, I think you, your idea is great. You know, unionize all of this stuff is great, but you have to make me do it. And that's exactly what we have to do now to make congressional leaders take notice, to make presidents take notice. We don't have, I, I've not seen, and I'm, I'm saying we as a people, we don't have that stick to itiveness that, that, that Power. One of the most powerful movements in this country was the civil rights movement. Was the civil rights movement. Change came. Change is still ongoing. But people don't, have, don't want to stand at the White House they, for, for hours and days at a time, work to get those permits, or standing in front of Capitol Hill. And I'm telling you, that's what that aggravation, that, that tension, that causing that scar for people to look at, that's what will make change and bring change, in my opinion. And I also have to say industry. I mean, I worked for a while in the technology industry, and I've done, I've dabbled in technology since 1995 when I started my first website. Um, and the first, the person who designed my website was African American. He actually is now a PhD student here at Harvard um, after many years in private industry. But in, when I worked at a tech company, there were no black coders at a company with 100 coders. And I think that one of the things that's happened is that you do see stratification mm -hmm. by different racial groups, you know, white, black, Asian American, Native American, uh, Latino ethnicities, which, ha you know, very different outcomes sometimes which have to do with race and ethnicity specifically, some of which have to do with, mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, what I call, uh, you know, sort of, the, the, the social aspect of hiring. People, people uh, conform to stereotypes about who is hireable, and then based on that, you know, like if you want to put, put together a startup team, there are actually some reasons why you want a kind of homogenous team at first, at least in terms of thought. You want people who you can spend 23 hours a day with in a room. Um, but once you start growing that to scale, you should not have a homogenous company. <coughs> And so I think we need to start looking at things from the industry perspective, which then cycles back to the issues of jobs, which then cycles to political empowerment. Can I say something quick about that, though, for a question of jobs? Because that's relevant to everybody who's here, right? Um, this is the world we live in, folks. Um, Washington, D.C. right now. New York City are the two hubs of the legal world, right? Average major law firm in New York and Washington has about a thousand people if they're a serious player. You know how many black partners or associates are at those firms? You're lucky if you have 10 to 15. Now, I went here, so that means I don't know how to do math by definition, but that's fractional, folks. We haven't had an African American seriously considered to be on the U.S. Supreme Court since Clarence Thomas by Bill Clinton, George Bush, or Barack Obama. Now, one of those three individuals, all of whom much good can be said about, now one of them has interviewed anybody black for the U.S. Supreme Court since 1991. That's just a reality. Does that mean there's no qualified jurist in this country in the last 20 years who's African American who might have served on the U.S. Supreme Court? And if you think there's not, stick them on the appeals court. So, you know, this is a problem that works its way through our system. 
How many times when African-American candidates want to run for office do we hear the question, is he electable? When Barack Obama was running in 2003 for the Senate in Illinois, all the major Democratic players in D.C. said, oh, he's a very smart young man, he's very capable, we just wish he was electable. I don't ever hear anybody ask if a white guy is electable. All right, we're going to turn to you. Hi, my name is David, and I'm a second-year student at the business school. My question concerns more of a longer-term sort of view. Can you talk about the impact that the growth in the Asian and Latino populations will have on electoral politics over the next 20 to 30 years? Thank you. Um, that would be huge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what she said. Uh, yeah, no. can, you can you repeat the question? I heard it, but it was uh, He said, what, what about the impact, the de demographic impact on Asian and let Latino populations on electoral politics? Right. And, I, and my answer is that it would be huge. Um, and, and part of that uh, with the, uh, we're taking, it's talking in generalities now, okay? Uh, Asian community right now is growing to uh, m larger and larger uh, uh, political power. And the Latinos have numbers. Uh, and they're prepared to flex the numbers as they should be. Should they Mm, it depends. Well, you know, it depends. We it vote depends. more than you think. Yeah. Seventy-four yeah. percent of blacks voted yeah. in the state of Alabama for president in 2008, and 65 percent voted in 2010. I think so there's you, this yeah. myth that blacks don't vote. Blacks are voting. Yeah, black, I, African Americans have slightly lower voting rates than white Americans, but I believe above Latino Americans. But of course, again. Latino is an ethnicity, and there are many different ethnicities who vote right. at different yeah. rates for different reasons in different regions. Florida is totally different from, you know, Massachusetts. Okay. I talked to Michael Steele before I walked into this building today, and he said, you know, the, the black population is just not even a consideration anymore for the Republican Party. They're just going gung-ho for the Hispanic population. Let me give you something. Uh, when Nixon uh, became president, 40% of African Americans voted for him. Mm -hmm. When George Bush became president, it was 9 to 11%. And I'll mm -hmm. never forget, J.C. Watt said, mm -hmm. J.C. Watt said, former congressman, said to me. Former uh, black congressman. Former black congressman, Re okay. Black Republican congressman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He's yes. And he never, he never <laughs> went to a CBC meeting, did he? Mm. I didn't go to a whole lot, so I don't fault him for that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> see, that's not right. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, he said to me, he said, uh, you know, during the Bush years when President Bush just got in, he said, oh, yes, uh, you know, I, I can see black America voting for, for uh, a GOP candidate, 40% of black America coming. I can see that coming. Now, at the primaries, these primaries now, the numbers are not measured at all. You cannot measure them for the black people going. They have totally just said, forget the black population. It, they washed their hands of it, and they're going for the Hispanic population. The Obama administration, Democrats also going for Hispanics, but unfortunately, African Americans, we have to find our leverage and, and find a way to make them, both parties, take note of our issues, take note of us. I think and that Mark Rubio's uh, statement uh, just uh, <coughs> yesterday coming out to say that he felt that the Republican Party was losing the young Latino voices and that it was incumbent, uh, it was an opportunity for the Republican Party, and I think for him, because he's a very attractive candidate from Florida and probably a vice presidential contender, sure um, to address immigration issues head on. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me just mm -hmm. point out a, a, a random demographic fact that will tell you something about why the Latino demographic is so hard to pin down. Um, of Latino is an ethnicity and not a race uh, in census figures. In the 2000 decennial census, Cuban Americans, 91% of, of a certain age cohort said they were white. In the 2010, cen 2010 decennial census, 41% of their children's generation said they were white. So there are, you can be, you know, race is many times something that is a perception and ties to the motherland or the fatherland, uh, depending on whether you're an immigrant or whether you're second, third generation. It, all of that, it, I mean, to a great extent, I think we may not know how the Latino demographics, plural, 
evolve right. in their politics. But Ron, before I move to our last questioner, do you think that the Republican Party has given up on black people? No, but we've done a terrible job. You know, I, I, I'd be the first one to tell you that. I think we lost a golden opportunity, and I, I think April was somewhere like 10 to 11 percent in, in Bush's first election. Mm -hmm. And you think, that's it? What are we not doing as a party that a significant portion of the electorate uh, is, who are African Americans or people of color are saying, I've written off the Republican Party. And I think that you have to start small and you have to start thinking bigger. Um, when I was the uh, policy director for George Allen, when he was running for the United States Senate in 2000, I said, you have to make a concerted effort to go into communities of color and go in there and keep your mouth shut. Listen. Politicians love to talk, and, and my, my friends here from Washington, I'm sure, would agree with the statement. You know, in the real world, the opposite of talking is listening. In the political realm, the opposite of talking is waiting to talk. And <laughs> I think, you know, a lot of these people in uh, the Republican Party, they just go and say, oh, yo, you're saying something. Wait, well, I'm thinking, what am I going to say? No, just stop and listen. And continually go to communities of color and listen and ask and say, what's on your mind? What are you thinking? What can I do better? And we don't do that. We show up, it's election time, hey, come vote for me, and then and go, to, yeah, go to the church, hallelujah, amen, yeah. and then psh, see you later. But no, Ron, can I make one quick point well, about but, but, but It has to be fact, really well, quick. We well, have two questioners, quick. so I, just I, to be respectful. I understand that, but I want to be respectful of this point, too. Uh, in the interest of fairness, everybody in the room ought to appreciate this. <laughs> there would not be a Tim Scott, in case you're wondering who Tim Scott is, Tim Scott is the only black member of Congress who, rep well, there are two black members of Congress who represent predominantly white districts, Tim Scott and Alan West. Let me say that again. There are only two African American members of Congress who represent predominantly white districts. I used to be the recruitment chair for the Democratic Party, so I know what I speak of. If an African-American candidate in the Democratic Party surfaced, it was always in a black district. If an African-American candidate, frankly, in the Democratic Party surfaced in a white district, the staff essentially took a look at it and said, oh, he's a good chap, but he's not electable. Now, 20 and 25-year-old African-Americans are going to figure that out at some point. Yeah, black folks are going to vote for Barack Obama. Barack Obama is always going to be on the ballot eventually 20 to 25-year-old African-Americans are going to figure out that there are more of them advancing in the Republican Party today in predominantly white environments than black Democrats are advancing in predominantly white environments, and them's just the facts. All right, with that, I will move on to, and, and I, I do agree with you on a factual basis, but we, we have to try to get all the voices in we can. And I'm going to ask each of you to speak back to back, and we will answer both of your questions as best as we can in the time we have left. So please introduce yourself and ask your question, and then you, sir. Thank you, and thank you all for coming out and sharing and having this conversation and dialogue. My name is Rena Moran. I'm a first-term legislator from the state of Minnesota. And so I'm going to have to do some clarity on a comment that I heard uh, around North, Norm Coleman and fraud in an election. I just want to first to say that it was a Republican uh, uh, Supreme Judge, uh, Supreme Justice, that determined that there was no fraud in that election. And of the millions of people who have voted in the state of Minnesota, 133 have been found to have committed fraud. And all of those 133 members were all ex-felons who are written to society, have been a part of the community, who thought they could vote. So I just want to bring clarity to that, that fraud just is not happening, or impersonation is not happening at all. So if it's not fraud that Republicans are bringing these constitutional, um, uh, uh, these voter ID bills and laws to states, it's a, it's a national agenda. If it's not fraud, then why do you think that we are attaching an ID to your right to vote. 
Because we attach the, the, it to so many other I, I'm going to take both questions back to back, and then we can answer. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brandon Dean, and uh, I had not wanted to do this, but as a citizen of the 7th Congressional District in the state of Alabama, uh, I felt it my obligation to ask a question today. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're we're going to slide over this but, one. <laughs> <laughs> but I do appreciate, uh, uh, you actually alluded to my question, uh, talking about Democrats and, and, and Republicans and, and, and having African Americans representing those um, districts where the majority of the citizens in those districts are not African American. Uh, how... And I, and I observe the same thing, um, not being the chairman of the committee that you were chairman of, but as someone who, who, who just observed politics. But um, how does the Democratic Party fix that moving forward, with, especially with this 2012? And I think we've made efforts toward that, but how do we fix that issue moving forward? I will let you go first. You know, thank you so much. Um, the Democratic Party needs to live up to its progressive ideals on racial inclusiveness. I'm amazed how many Democratic politicians talk a wonderful game on race when they get behind a pulpit. Mm. I'm amazed how many white Democratic Southern politicians can even get a little bit of cadence and a little bit of rhythm when they get behind a pulpit. Mm -hmm. Heck, I can even do it. Uh, but on the, when you ask them the question, are you ever willing to get behind an African American candidate, for something outside of a black district, they will give you 50 reasons to sunrise why they will not. And it's not just Artur Davis, it's any African American who has surfaced at a serious statewide level in North Carolina, Alabama, Virginia, virtually all of these states in the last several years. And if you sit there thinking Harold Ford was the example, let me tell you, they tried very hard to get Phil Bredesen, the governor of Tennessee, to knock Brother Harold aside. Folks who ran the Democratic Party in Tennessee didn't want Harold for it. I would just for once love to see some good old white Democrats step up and say, here's an African-American politician we think we can get behind. So I'll tell you one other little thing. Oh, I, I, well, I have to, I have to. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave the one little thing out. No, we, yeah, we, okay. we don't have time. Right. For, we don't have time out. for <laughs> one last little thing be, because what I want to do is, is also get a response to our first questioner. And then I want to do a speed round. And I mean speed round, speed round to find out who you think is going to win in the fall. So does anyone want to get to the fraud question? Yeah, I'll get to the fraud question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, let me, let me answer the, the generalized yeah. question. I, again, the, the question of the matter is that there was an allegation that there were fraudulent ballots that were cast. And yes, it did go through the court system. It only underscores my point that there is a sense in that particular race that it was stolen. It was stolen by people who weren't legally eligible to vote. And the way that it was adjudicated, I think, is the right way, which is, of course, going through the court system. So for those who say that it doesn't happen or it hasn't existed, that's one prime case. And I will cut it short right there. All right, so speed round. Who do you think is going to win the presidency in the fall, and what is the pivot factor? That's it. Oh, I don't have a clue who will win, but the worst thing Barack Obama should worry about, if the health care law gets struck down, and the whole conversation in August, September, and October is what the next health care law is going to look like, that ain't good for Barack Obama. All right, that's Artur Davis, who is currently a fellow at the IOP and a former congressman from Alabama's 7th District, one of uh, the folks right there. We're going to turn to April Ryan. I think there's, there's eight months, and there's, uh, it's a long time in politics. Anything can happen. So today, President Obama could be up. Next week, he could be down as low as he can go. But you just you never know. But I will tell you this, the economy, the economy, the economy. And three months before the election, if the economy is bad, the polls may reflect that. And also on health care, if one provision is struck down, he's all right. If the individual mandate is struck and everything else is intact, I think he's that's, okay. That's probably right. Yeah, yeah, it is right. It is right. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and there <laughs> okay, that's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's April Ryan, White House correspondent for American Urban Radio Networks. And... Uh, Will someone please give me a prediction? Perhaps Ron Christie. Can we get a prediction? Yes. I, I asked I, for a fortune cookie, and I, I'm, you know. Well, look at these guys hedging their bets. Say. Yeah. Well, no, you don't know what I'm going to say. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I'm going to say. I, I think Peggy Noonan, who is a brilliant columnist for the Wall Street Journal, uh, summed it up exactly right in her column today, where she said, Barack Obama can lose. 
but he can only lose if the Republicans, of course, beat themselves. And I think with the economy being as weak as it is, I think the president's record, I think looking at the health care initiative, he should be easily beatable. But the Republicans have a remarkable propensity to blow it. And so do I think that Romney's going to win? Yeah, I do think Romney's going to win. But do I think that we have an extremely uh, odd way of just losing and blowing it and self-destructing? Uh, yep, we've seen it before. We could see it again. But I put my money on Governor Mitt Romney. All right, thank you so much. I love a prediction. Ron Christie, founder and president of Christie Strategies and former IOP fellow and oh, well, Kelly Crossley. Be, you won't be getting any prediction from me. Here's what I would say. There Why are not? such Why uh, not? You, what, you, journalists, you, you, uh, you, you, I'm you, not you, saying. No, 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 wait. <laughs> no, 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 let me no, give you some wait, no, 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 let's give no, you so some let's be real. This is, this is it. Yes. You're afraid that if you make the wrong prediction, no. you won't get to the White House Christmas party. No, I'm not there now. <laughs> I'm not there now. No, Ron, if Mitt is there, I'll just get in. <laughs> I'll bring it. Okay. Here's your She's my guest. No, no. I, say, <laughs> I think that what is interesting, this is a, such an interesting, uh, or will be an interesting race. If the presumed candidate is Mitt Romney, um, what I said before about there being a stark contrast in policy is really going to be on the table. So that's the first thing. I mean stark. So that, you know, there will be no, maybe you like this or you like this. That's it. I think there are, for both parties, there are reasons for people to stay home. And, for, and reasons to gin up the base, to stay home on Barack Obama's side, maybe the black people who are unemployed and the pookies who are frustrated <laughs> and whatever, and they're just done with him. On, on, the, on the Republican side, I didn't want Mitt, just didn't want him, just didn't want him not going. You know, that's, mm -hmm. those are reasons for people to stay at home. On either side, on the Republican side, I didn't want Mitt, but you know what? Hate Barack Obama, gotta go. <laughs> on, on, on Barack Obama's side, um, I didn't, I'm not happy, not right where we want to be, but look at that daggone Supreme Court. Listen to this racist stuff that's going out here, and I am using it advisedly here, and I got to get up and just defend, you know? So there are reasons on both sides to gin up for either side, and there are reasons for folk to stay home. So this will be a very, very interesting race, I think. Uh, one of the most interesting that we've seen in a while. And eight months is a long daggone time. She didn't give us a prediction. She didn't uh, give no. a prediction. I'm not, I, I, no. You, you, win, the, a you win the prediction prize. I'm going to have to come up with no. one. That was, that was Callie Crossley. Final word to Callie Crossley, who is the host of her own show, The Callie Crossley Show on WGBH Radio. And I just want to thank Callie, Ron, April, and former Congressman Arthur Davis for a thrilling panel full of surprises, including... For me, the surprise is that we didn't get more than one prediction, but that's all right. We'll see what happens. Thanks so much. <laughs>